Years ago, while chaperoning my daughter's field trip to Fort Snelling in Minnesota, we visited the doctor's office to see how the troops' illnesses were treated nearly 200 years ago. The volunteer presenter explained that in those days, bleeding a sick man was thought to be helpful, while today we know this weakens the immune system and hurts the patient's recovery. I asked a simple question, why would they do that? To which she answered without skipping a beat, we had no germ theory. We didn't know germs and viruses existed. This is the same in our medicine today, which lacks a cogent consciousness theory, a theory that explains how our thoughts come into being. Everyone has a consciousness, electromagnetic in form. Each consciousness is unique and yet equally capable of what one might call normal function. The key takeaway is that your consciousness is a separate entity from your body. These are two separate aspects which make up the whole, the mind and the body. Your brain, therefore, is a transceiver, receiving and sending signals with your consciousness. When someone has a brain injury, what has been disrupted is the signal. The consciousness you knew before the injury is still there. Its signal, however, is no longer clear. For children, creating a clear signal is done with routine. These routines create healthy habits with positive outcomes that last a lifetime. Children who grow up in broken homes often lack a positive routine, which manifests as chaotic and destructive patterns often displayed first by their parents and mimicked further in their lives. It is important to remember that both patterns, a good routine and a chaotic routine, embed the practice in the exact same way. Let's explore the process. Our neural pathway density is analogous to the four stages of consciousness. When a baby is born, they are what we call unconsciously incompetent. They don't know what they don't know. As the baby grows, they discover gravity, Balance. and they will become what is called consciously incompetent. I am now aware there are things that I don't know. As the child learns to walk, they become what is called consciously competent. I know what I know when I think about it. At the highest level, we become unconsciously competent. We act with little, if any, thought because we know what we know unconsciously. When you reach unconsciously competent, the brain has a different wiring, which is at the heart of this science. The synapse of the brain is fairly simple to understand. When a signal reaches the synapse, it releases a chemical called serotonin, which is picked up by the other side, and the signal continues on its happy way. Any unused serotonin is then sucked back up by the synapses. It's important to note that these two never physically actually touch. At the unconsciously competent synaptic level, a protein forms across the neural pathway, called nectin-3, effectively adding stability and a bridge between the synapses. Because of this bridge, the neurons behave differently in a very important way. I call the grouping of these adhesions the nectin-3 platform of the brain. These represent the ever and always internal and self-referential story of me, which manifests as my personality of subconscious actions. When an electrical signal is sent from the neuron down the axon, the electrical signal can be seen jumping the spaces of what are known as the node of Ranvier as it moves to the axon terminal and the synapses at the end where the signal is transmitted. This next part is critical to understand. When the synapses at the axon terminal have a nectin-3 adhesion, as the electrical signal begins to jump the spaces on the axon, the nectin-3 adhesion prematurely fires the synapses before the signal has reached it. For an addict, the race to fire the synapses between use and don't use looks like this. Signal, jump, jump, nectin-3 wins. When you ask an alcoholic, can't you just decide not to drink? The answer is no. The impulse to drink is firing neurons at a far higher rate than the neurons saying don't do it. To have a curative effect, we first and foremost must eliminate the nectin-3 adhesion that gives these synapses their advantage. This is the nature of all addiction. 
you are hardwired to desire the pathway trigger, and few do this as well as nicotine and opioids. To break the addiction, we must dissolve the nectin-3. The Thousand Yard Stare is an expression used to characterize the state of a soldier after a traumatic event. There appears behind the eyes to be nobody home. In traumatic events, the brain releases an enzyme called MMP9. This enzyme dissolves the nectin-3 platforms of the brain, eliminating the ever and always internal and self-referential story of me. The soldier's brain is flushed literally of who they were. In the emptiness, the brain begins to do something vital that we understand. It begins writing the trauma in a new Nectin-3 platform as the baseline experience that defines them. Every addiction that follows after that is an effort to deaden the Nectin-3 platform we call post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. All of these people have experienced trauma. They all suffer from the same Nectin-3 platform disorder. They're not criminals. They're all sick, and we should treat them as such, with compassion and treatment. So how does psychedelic science work, and why? I want to be clear in what this science does for people. There is a healthy consciousness that can work through the trauma if we can clear the Nectin-3 signal. When the trauma first occurred, we know that MMP9 was released, accompanied by a low electrical signal, which leaves a person in a disconnected state. This is one method of clearing the Nectin-3 platform. Psilocybin treatment benefits can be seen in their contrast to the trauma. When a person uses psilocybin, it will also trigger the release of MMP9 in the brain and cause the Nectin-3 to dissolve. This is the feeling of openness that individuals experience. The key, however, is that it puts the brain into a high state of awareness and communication. As you see in this image, on the left is the placebo, the brain in a standard state of being. On the right are the neural connections between the different parts of the brain, colored, for your understanding that really an incredible amount of new communication occurs in the use of psilocybin. This allows individuals to work through problems and create new neural pathways of thinking about one's life. This is the healing effect that they experience. A connection. Patients often pair the treatment with acceptance and commitment therapy, although formal therapy is not required to gain the benefits of psilocybin use. Some key things to know. There is no toxic level of psilocybin mushrooms. There are no observable long-term implications to its use. There is no risk of abuse or addiction because, as I explained before, it actually stops addiction by the dissolution of the Nectin-3. And most importantly, it's pennies to produce. The primary mechanism of psychedelic science is to connect people back to their emotions, allowing a stable and productive consciousness to manifest through. Peace.